Now turning to our program, I'm pleased to welcome Marelka Velez, Senior Director of Marketing at Associated Bank, to introduce our speaker, Marelka. Thank you, President Karen. Good afternoon, Rotarians and guests. It is my honor today to introduce a close friend and well-recognized and accomplished journalist, Aaron Richards. Aaron has been a Rotarian since 2021, and before that has uh, graced our platform as a panelist on several topics with the Milwaukee Press Club. So Aaron is now the new editorial director at the Center of Reinventing Public Education, a nonprofit education research organization housed at Arizona State University. In that role, she manages and edits the written products tied to the center's research, such as reports, commentaries, and newsletters. And she also works with ASU's Teachers College on education innovation initiatives. Before joining the center last year, Erin was the national education reporter for USA Today. And before that, she was an education reporter and government reporter at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. This trajectory, by the way, never would have happened unless she had uh, been accepted as an intern at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in 2006, which, uh, by the way, she missed the deadline for. So, Erin was born and raised in St. Louis, and she attended Murray State University in Kentucky, and then the Graduate School of Journalism at the University of Missouri Columbia. While at the Journal Sentinel, Erin won the Spencer Fellowship for Education Reporting at Columbia University in New York City which allowed her to research the legacy of Milwaukee's voucher program and workshop a book about a Milwaukee teacher who adopted his student. Later, Erin used a reporting fellowship at Marquette University to study the damaging academic and social effects of students repeatedly switching schools. Erin is a member of the Milwaukee Press Club and serves on their board of the club's endowment, which raises money to support young journalists. She is also a contributing producer for a documentary film about art, art critics made by Mary Louise Schumacher. Um, some of you may remember Mary Louise when she was here um, uh, earlier last year when she spoke about the art preserve uh, at the John Michael Kohler Preserve um, Art Center. Erin lives in Bayview and is also a former horse trainer who boards her aging thoroughbred Hobbs in Caledonia. In her free time, she makes space to host regular gatherings and theme parties that have connected some of Milwaukee's most colorful and joyous movers and shakers. And so we welcome Erin. Um, thank you, everyone. It's really good to be back here today. And um, well, we have a lot to get through. And I would, before we start, um, the Nashville shooting has been on my mind today, and I feel like I can't talk about schools and K-12 education and broad awareness and support for our communities without just doing something. I feel like moments of silence don't do much these days, but I'm going to ask for one anyway. Could we just take a few minutes and recognize the loss of life of students and staff there? Okay, thank you. It's um, really difficult to continue to um, have to live and breathe in that space, and uh, I just want to recognize the educators that uh, keep finding themselves in that position, as well as families and students. Um, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about pandemic recovery, how our kids are doing today, both in Wisconsin and nationwide. For the majority of my career, actually since I was 16, I've been a, re a news reporter. Uh, I left USA Today last year at about this time to become the editorial director of a nonprofit research shop that used to be housed at the University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, they found a new home at Arizona State University, which has a lot of uh, broad scale initiatives to kind of redesign K-12 education, um, micro-credentialing. They've, they've really kind of moved into a space, both with their teacher's college and their whole um, strategy at the university to really embrace education innovation. And the researchers that I work with are um, mostly qualitative researchers. So it's a lot of um, interviewing. Uh, sometimes we, we team up with groups like RAND Corporation to do surveying. Um, but we're really in the here and now of what is happening on the ground in schools and what does the research tell us about what's happening and how do we use that research to make better decisions that make 
classrooms more engaging, that make uh, teaching more efficient and more attractive at a time when we're facing a lot of shortages and concern about the prestige of the workforce. So I'll just remind you that this is what I used to do, which was a lot of running around the country. I never left uh, Milwaukee to join USA Today. I've been working from Milwaukee this whole time, which was a bit of sleight of hand. Most people thought I was in DC. And uh, now we're here. So um, it has been a transition, but also an exciting opportunity to work in a space where we're very committed to giving schools and school leaders what they need in the moment to potentially make um, decisions that can change the trajectory of teaching or the lives of kids. So this is some of the stuff um, I actually quoted the Center on Reinventing Public Ed a lot during the pandemic. I knew about them. They've always been on the scene, but they were a little bit plotting before the pandemic. And then they really kicked it up. They were scraping data from the 100 largest districts in the country, including Milwaukee Public Schools, and saying, how are you delivering education right now? If you're virtual, do you have to be in person or do you have to be synchronous or is it all offline work and your teacher checks in with you on email? So I became really interested in this and I felt at some point that people were going to think I didn't have any other sources around the country because I kept quoting these guys. Um, but it's been really, really helpful. So we've studied, we did about 20 case studies on how micro schools operated around the country. We had a specific focus on micro schools led by people of color, which was an interesting shift. A lot of the news that was written about micro schools at the time was focused on how affluent parents were designing these like small learning communities or in their home. And we really looked at, oh, I mean, we saw some of those too, but we really, I still have a hard time with our acronym for our name. Uh, it is called SERPI. Uh, education reporters around the country like to call it creepy, which I find much funnier. I will try to stay um, on brand. Anyway, we did a lot of research around micro schools and particularly what it looked like when People who didn't always have a lot of power in education were designing their own learning communities. Uh, we're continuing some of this research on a couple of groups around the country. This was some of the research that we did, uh, scraping data on how are the 100 largest districts spending their COVID relief money. A lot of people didn't want to see that money go to, um, you know, expenses that would continue and not have a cutoff because that money is finite. Um, MPS, like a lot of other districts around the country with aging school buildings, spends a lot of it on infrastructure. So that, that kind of research and surveying was what we were able to tell from this stuff. Uh, and then this is from CBS Sunday Morning last Sunday, and it just kind of sets the stage for what we're going to talk about next when it comes to where we go from here and how kids are doing right now. Three years ago this month, with pandemic fears at their peak, nearly all public schools in the United States were closed. But Tracy Smith finds that even as COVID recedes, our children are still paying the price. It sure looks like the pandemic is over. Stadiums are open again. Crowds are everywhere and hardly a mask in sight. But COVID hurt a lot of things you can't easily see, especially in schools. I feel like I just need to stand on a mountaintop and just yell to folks, take this seriously. Everything is at stake right now. And Jeffrey Canada knows he's the founder of the Harlem Children's Zone in Manhattan. We all knew that the pandemic was going to affect education, but how bad is it? We've got the data now, and things are bad. They're actually worse than most of us thought. In fact, I would tell you that we have an education crisis right now. The actual numbers vary by community, but according to a nationwide test given to fourth and eighth graders, reading skills dropped to the lowest point in 30 years. And in math, nearly 40% of eighth graders couldn't understand basic concepts, the worst performance since testing began back in 69. This is not just poor kids uh, who are living in the urban centers. It's all over America. There's been a drop scores. This goes along with the loss of students in school, with the increased violence that's happening and the behavioral problems that kids are facing. In my career of more than 45 years, I've never seen anything close to this. And it's not hard to see how it happened. Experts say remote teaching and a lack of computers at home are to blame. Some of you know this already runs a, uh, the Harlem Children's Zone is very much focused on getting parents in the door before they even have their kids, giving them skills to participate in their children's education, uh, support their children in the home. Um, that program has been running for a long, long time. I just wanna point out, um, I pulled some recent stats that show you what's happening in Milwaukee and Wisconsin. These are those scores that they referred to on the chalkboard in the video. 
where it showed you the, the dramatic drop in scores. Math scores have actually dropped even um, more dramatically than reading. There's some speculation that reading didn't go quite as bad because some parents were reading with their kids in the home, but that many parents lack the math skills to really continue to help their kids learn and grow what they would need to in a normal course of a school year. See on here, but you can see that um, we've got National Public, Milwaukee is the green. Um, again, this is reading, and you can see that even statewide, we're kind of down. I mean, we're Wisconsin liked to think of itself years ago as well above the national average, but you can see here we're pretty close to where we're slightly above it, but it's not, you know, it's not wonderful performance. And then this one's pretty dramatic. So that um, uh, the reason why Milwaukee has that break in there, there's a special breakout for urban districts that take this national exam. It's called the Nation's Report Card or the National Assessment um, of Educational Progress. They break out large cities. Milwaukee elected not to participate that year. I'm really glad they got back in it because having data is the only way that we can compare districts that are the size of Milwaukee to other like districts that are that are operating under the same challenging circumstances, right? A lot of low-income families, a lot of challenging community um, pressures and um, distractions from what would otherwise be a, a solid focus on your kid's development. So I, for Milwaukee, but also for Wisconsin, it's really important to pay attention to. So a lot of you know these already. They've been in the news headlines. Um, what struck me recently was the report that came out from uh, this. Every two years, the CDC runs a survey to high school kids. It's all taken anonymously. It's called the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And it asks kids all kinds of questions about cigarette use, uh, sexual activity. And the amount of kids in Wisconsin that reported that they are experiencing uh, daily anxiety, consistently feeling sad and hopeless, particularly for teen girls, particularly for kids that identify as queer or anything other than straight and um, sort of cis-presenting. Um, these are really important things to watch because we are concerned about academics and it's easy to look at proficiency versus not proficient. But we also need to be taking stock of where kids are at mentally. There are better ways to do this, but many schools, including in this area, just aren't doing them yet because there's never really been pressure to do that. Most of the pressure in the last 20 years has been around measuring standard, measuring its academic achievement based on standardized tests. We're at a moment now where that could change, but there isn't a lot happening. In the same way that that film clip set up, people are kind of back doing what they were doing before instead of motoring ahead with something different. Um, when I joined Serpy, we were working on a project called the State of the American Student, and it was a compendium of, of the organization's research over the last two and a half years of the pandemic. And it didn't, as I, I always have my news hat on, so I pointed out, I said, guys, there's really no, there's no new news here. We've reported all this before, but we put it all together so we could say, hey, look, this is where we're at right now. And then I found these kids around the country and interviewed them and we included their video interviews um, in the final package of this. Uh, Mia Moore on the far right there. It, some of you may know Charlene Moore of Urban Underground. So I mostly trotted around following them for a few days and did a great video of Mia. She's at Rufus King. Hopefully we'll motor through everything and, and she'll get a say at the end. Uh, you have to look forward to that because there's going to be a bunch of slides with bullets and a bunch of statistics that are going to bore you. But they're really important. Um, so we, this is just kind of what's the context of what's happening locally. And again, this is not just an MPS problem. This is not just issues facing low-income kids. Graduation rates are goofy at the moment because a lot of kids graduated without the actual skills and knowledge they would have otherwise had to have in a normal year. So there's been a little bit of a dip um, statewide, but not a whole lot. I suspect if you break out in MPS, the low income, the graduation rate for low income students versus the graduation rate for students in MPS who are not low income, there's a way bigger dramatic, a, a way more dramatic drop. Um, I mean, that 50% graduation rate, those are kids that are often falling into this category that we often call opportunity youth. It's kind of like 18 to 20, 21, 22, 23, where if you haven't got something lined up after graduation, if you don't have a solid structure to go to, if you're not working every day, those are the students that often kind of fall into this morass of young adulthood and they don't have a lot of support. And they're often the students that are not going to eventually be able to make an income that's going to be family sustaining um, they're sometimes the ones getting into trouble because there's just not structure around their lives. And most of the handholding ends once our K-12 system in America gets you out the door your senior year. You guys know the rest of these. Uh, the fiscal challenge I'm hearing from, I had actually kind of re up some of my contacts before this speech because so much of my work now is looking around the country. I had to go back and say, what is the, what are we at on the budget figures here? Um, 
So we've got some really challenging situations. Um, you know, when I saw Mequon reporting that they they need an additional 5.4 million right now just to be able to not only sustain their teachers, but give them a little bit of a raise. Most of us in private companies expect at least a cost of living increase. So when I see affluent districts also sounding alarm bells, that's when I get concerned as well that this is a much more widespread problem. Um, so we've done some research. Um, the Center on Reinventing Public Ed is very focused now to this pivot point of how do we use this moment to keep the urgency on not just getting kids who lost a lot of academics during the um, pandemic, uh, kind of like refilling the gaps in their knowledge, but also how do we use this moment to do something different that many kids either were asking for and parents were asking for before the pandemic, or some kids found a different way of learning in the last couple of years that actually worked better for them. Uh, we had independent kids spending more time offline. They, these were kids that never liked group projects to begin with. We had a lot more opportunities to have kids doing um, hands-on work, sometimes out in the community, integrating that. And that's in part because some of the rules were out the window for a while. And I don't think we should lose that like spark of inspiration. And I think that we need to encourage systems to keep trying something different if it's working for kids. And that might mean that we might need to allow some wiggle room once in a while from some of the um, structures and expectations and reporting that we've done before. Problem is that all takes legislative action. Um, often there's political barriers. So it's, it's hard to move these ships in a more nimble direction, but if there's ever gonna be a time to do it, it's now. Um, one of the most interesting studies we did, uh, just to, we published it in January, uh, we teamed up with Rand Corporation, which does a lot of uh, research in uh, kind of the economic space, business space. They have an education team as well. I used to work with them as a reporter, and now I'm like on the on the other side of the fence. Half of superintendents across the country, this is a representative sample, said that their teachers aren't getting through material because of these political conflicts locally around race, sexuality, and gender. COVID-19 is still um, in the mix. And then one third of them, this is the kind of guessed the half. I didn't think that a third of superintendents were going to say that their educators and their school board members are regularly receiving verbal threats or written threats from their own community members. This one strikes me because in all the surveying that we've ever seen and written about, most people think that everybody else's schools are doing kind of crummy, but they think their local schools are great. And when I see this shift, it worries me. Like I'm worried about that. Um, and I don't know what to do about it yet. Some superintendents said they've gotten better at, you know, very calm, sit down with the parents and talk about what the, what the um, concern is. Getting better at sharing why you're changing the curriculum or why you're teaching the way you do. Um, at the same time, all that takes time away from professional development and all these other things that we can do in school to make schools more efficient or just more engaging for kids. Um, I, there's a lot of surveying around how so many parents think that their kid is on grade level. That is not just low-income parents, that is parents across the board. And you've got maybe teachers in the 20 or 30% category that think their kids are actually on track. Um, this McKinsey report was that, you know, most, that was supposed to be for this year, meaning this school year, um, which would have been about 900,000 students, or sorry, teachers. I'm not sure if that number rang true, but I was going to go look it up after this. And then... Um, Another interesting study that came out recently was about how many adults don't think the main purpose of high school anymore should be academic, uh, rigorous academic preparation for college. There were more parents that said they think the purpose of high school should be more around practical skills. Everything from daily life activities to cooking, which I was also struck by. So there is something happening in culture right now that is connected to how we're teaching kids and how we're preparing the next generation. And I think that we still need to be thinking about how we're going to how we're going to latch into that and meet parents' needs and kids' expectations, and also just engage them in a system that isn't always as you know fun as staying home and uh, you know gaming. Um, this is kind of our uh, the Center on Reinventing Public Ed's uh, mission right now. We think that we need to be doing things different. We've ramped up our research. We're doing um, sub grants now to researchers thanks to a big Walton Foundation family, sorry Walton Family Foundation grant that we got, we're actually able to um, ask researchers, uh, our big focus right now is high school. I'm going here, I'll wait on this in a minute. So we have a big focus on high school right now because 
Students at that age have so little time left to regain what they've lost. And we know that, um, you know, freshman year especially is a very difficult time. If you start failing classes, your likelihood of graduating is going to be far less. Um, so now we're offering, we're offering researchers around the country an opportunity to, to apply for these grants and we'll um, uh, evaluate them. And then we, uh, as part of getting the grant, uh, this is happening with another, uh, we have another grant running with um, school districts can apply to say, we have an idea to do something different, which is different from some of the grant making that philanthropies have done in the past, because in the past, it was always like, we'll give you money if you'll commit to grading your teachers. We'll give you money if you commit to making small schools. We'll give you money if you create more charter schools. This one is finally saying, and maybe this is where we're moving to a better place. We'll give you money if you have an idea and you can show that you have some amount of structures in place to try it out. You have a theory of what you're going to go for. You've got some political support. And I think that maybe that's a better way to go about it right now, that these need to be much more individualized solutions. These are just some of the cool things that we've been watching around the country and that some of them were, were, con oh, we're continuing to study. This Mesa uh, Public Schools, they have started to have m much more of their schools stop the one teacher in one classroom model. And they're having three classrooms with three or four teachers, and they're combining English, science, world language, math, I think. Emily is a, a communications manager for Surfy as well. And we, we went through these schools, and we're looking at 120 kids in a classroom with teachers kind of moving any, everywhere. The fun thing about doing that visit with PhD researchers is that the hunch that I've always had sometimes about academic lessons not being super rigorous. And you can tell, you know, kids aren't super engaged. The, our um, colleagues were like, yeah, it's, it's going to need some more. These guys need a little bit more support to kick this up. But they're trying something different, right? They're trying to say, look, this profession is lonely. You don't get to advance very quickly. You can't leave to go take your kid to the dentist at 1 p.m. because that's the only appointment you could get. And in this model, teachers were really working as teams together. This has been tried before, but Mesa's trying it across their entire district and sometimes across some of their um, entire schools, and then they're trying to get to where it's much more prevalent across the district, but still allowing for traditional models to exist because some people are still going to want those. Um, we, we're also putting a big emphasis on the Oakland reach. This is where I think there's this kind of, we've seen the power of parents go in two different directions. You've seen a lot of parents kind of rise up, um, run for school board, um, especially on the kind of Republican side. There's been a lot of um, strategy around, um, you know, uh, getting people involved in school board elections because it's 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 far easier to change your local school district than it is to change you know a, like a big system that you're not invested in and um in oakland they've got a grassroots parents group that kind of rose up independently during the pandemic and decided that they were going to have their own learning communities and now what they're doing in part because Oakland, like many districts, doesn't have enough tutors and uh, uh, people to teach literacy. They're taking underemployed or unemployed parents in the community. They're putting them through an eight or 12 week intensive course about how to teach the basics of li literacy using phonics, using the science of reading. And then they're having those parents work with the district. So they're getting employment. They're working in the school. They have these very you know structured lessons that they're doing. And Oakland thinks that this may be something where this grassroots group is actually going to link into the district because the problem with boutique innovation is that it sometimes isn't applicable across an entire system. So we're doing a lot more research on them uh, this year as well. I'm running short on time. Um, North Dakota has used their federal relief funds to, to uh, train board members. It's a two or three day training and they have a, like a certificated program around it. And tutoring, some states... Um, are really putting much more money toward uh, tutoring initiatives. Tutoring works, but it has to be intensive. It has to be what they call high dosage, and it needs to be um, regular. So they found it's best when it's integrated during the school day. The problem is finding the staffing to support that has been a challenge. Um, okay, good. I got to Mia. She gets a couple of minutes here. So again, this is Mia. Um, I think this is important because I think we need to do a much better job of adults of listing and asking kids directly what they want and what works for them in schools. Towards the end of, my, the end of my year and the, my full freshman year, I was out of school and completely virtual. And just that whole experience was really tough for me because I'm not like a virtual learner. In the years to come, I feel as though I would need more teacher support. I would love to see me build one-on-one -on -one connections with my teachers and not just that 
like the surface level of just a teacher and a student, I would like to see um, my teachers know more about me because a lot of the times teachers don't familiarize themselves with students. Um, you know, they just assign the homework and leave it at that, but they don't understand like what students go through at home or their personal life. And, you know, they're assigning all this homework. So it's hard to be able to build those connections with teachers and know what teachers need or know what students need from teachers. Another thing I would say is mental health resources um, is very important, especially like with counseling. Um, for me, like just coming back from virtual, you know, I didn't want to talk with my parents about certain things, you know, that I will with the, someone else. I feel like that's also important. That's also something that I want to see more in schools and more councils of color, because a lot of the times we have, you know, white counselors or counselors that don't represent us or don't look like me. Um, so I would love to see that. Dude, we're, um, especially kids of color, we're really focused on um, validation, recognition of their personhood in schools. I think that it's easy to not uh, honor that as much as we should, but it's a theme that comes across, especially when you're talking to high school students. Incidents of racism make it very difficult for kids to learn. Um, and if you ask them specifically, they, you, you will get the same answer over and over again. And um, I know that there's a lot of controversy around the teaching of race and racism in schools. There's lots of ways to do that responsibly. Yes, there are ways to do that irresponsibly, but I think that we need to try to trust educators a little bit more because it is difficult history, but it's really important for people to learn. And it's really important for kids of color to have that, um, that history, that um, ownership and the sort of the, the, the same validation that many of us get when we're kind of uh, white and um, in, the, in the majority. I'm finishing up quick because I know we have to go to questions. These are just some ideas. These are certainly not exhaustive. Um, I know equity can also be this buzzword for, you know, some kind of um, devious attempt at um, critical race theory. Uh, it's just about trying to make sure that kids that don't start with as much get a little bit more help. Um, I was fortunate to have two-parent household uh, parents that kept moving to go to good, well-funded suburban schools in St. Louis. I just got lucky. I spent a lot of time on the north and south side of Milwaukee with kids that just didn't get lucky from the get-go. And so that's always on my mind when I think about this stuff. Um, ask in your district, what, what are their goals for recovery? One thing we found in this is that people just keep going back to what they've been doing before. I want to know, like, where do you want to be in five years? Like, what are you measuring? Are you measuring kids' emotional health and well-being? How? If you're not, why? Is there anything we could do? I mean, you've got some federal funds. Yes, we've got lots of other priorities, but I think emotional health and wellness for kids and making sure we have resources for them, even if it means, if it means we're contracting with telehealth services, which many districts are starting to do, is a, uh, should be a big priority. Um, your school, uh, uh, elections are coming right up. You can make sure you know who your school board candidates are and vote. And then mentoring. Um, I, uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to join Rotary and one of the reasons why I've always appreciated Rotary is that you guys have such a strong mentoring program, investment in high school students, um, a lot of uh, money and support around education. And so um, I'm mentoring a young woman named Kahala Hicks down at Rust College. Uh, I have to admit, I'm not always the best mentor. I'm trying to get better at it. But um, if more of us did at least a little bit, even kind of badly, it would really make a dent. And I know we're all invested in our own families and our own communities and our own friends. But if you can do a little bit more for everybody else, I think we'd be in a better place. Um, I, I'm one minute over. Is it time for questions? Anyone have anything? Hi. Wallace from UW Milwaukee in this in the School of Education. Yeah. You mentioned representation of teachers of color. We know that less than around 14% of all teachers across the United States identify as people of color. Have you seen any promising practices for recruiting and retaining more teachers of color? One of the most successful things we've been seeing so far, and they're still kind of, I don't want to say niche, they're just fledgling is these programs where we're being much more deliberate in high school at identifying kids of color who are invested in some kind of element of social education 
and giving them a very deliberate on-ramp into education school. And then like, but that takes a lot of nurture. It takes a lot of staff time to nurture that. Um, but before the pandemic, I maybe saw two or three good grow your own programs around the country. I'm seeing way more of them now. And some of them require outside funding. I mean, these are programs that if you're going to cocoon kids with some support, it's going to need to have a little bit more um, resources there. Um, also, like this goes back to like loan forgiveness too. Let's make sure that students aren't, let's, make, let's incentivize becoming a teacher by making sure that it doesn't cost you a whole lot to go through the training and that you have the support you need to get, get through it. Sure. Hi, Brent Tepp, Lawson, Milwaukee Small Business Coach. I've got a couple kids in MPS. Uh, I, I noticed that most of the report outs kind of involve more district level, but you've done obviously work with charter. So like what, what is the, and sometimes the impacts with funding impact charter harder than it does at the public level. So what, what is the impact that's going on with charters in terms of their recovery, where they're sitting at? Uh, that's, uh, do you mean just locally, nationally? More concerned locally, but if you have national too, that's great. I knew I was going to get this question. So the problem with being national and based in Milwaukee is that you start to lose touch a little bit with some of your old, all of your old stomping grounds and your old sources. You know, charter schools have always had a little bit more flexibility to, um, they've, they've always had a little bit more flexibility from the state rules. That's, that's part of the, the bargain. We give you flexibility, you show us that you can get performance outcomes that are at, at least as good, if not hopefully better. Um, we've seen, I saw more charters doing much more deliberate virtual schooling and figuring out actually really good ways of virtual schooling. Uh, I think because the staff was smaller and more nimble, um, I see more charter schools spending their money on um, structured after-school tutoring, in part because they can pressure parents. I mean, they can't always mandate parents, but you can certainly make it seem like it's a mandate, even if it's just uh, pressure. And certainly more um, summer school programs, too. I've seen more of the charters around here do that. I don't know if, the, if that's your experience, are your kids at a charter school in MPS or? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's just, um, you know, those across the board are good, but the charters often have a little bit more control over their funding, um, which just makes it, it increases the skids a bit to get things rolling. Thanks. Uh, very good presentation. Thank you very much. Very provocative. I work for a school district that's a disruptive school district in, in another part of the state, and I went to Rob Hankin. I don't think Rob is here from the policy forum, wanted a white paper, and he said, uh, he came out of the Ann Casey project here in Milwaukee, and, and he said, we know what works, mentoring, uh, peer support, and leadership, um, uh, individualized instruction, and a hook, it could be sports, music, or something else. In that context, my organization is looking at a couple of things, sports is a hook to gather, to motivate, also uh, micro-credentialing. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'd be curious as to your interest in micro-credentialing, which I thought would be as it relates to skills, it could be academic or work. Micro-credentialing as it relates to uh, soft skills, life skills. And micro-credentialing as it relates to civic skills. I'm part of the community, uh, and I want to help build it instead of do something else. So the issue is micro-credentialing and its role in education. Yeah. Um, it's certainly happening more now. One of the things that I've been kind of excited to watch grow at ASU, they have an entire micro-credentialing program that's growing, um, and not just for students, but for, again, kind of, aiming at adults in the community that may have a couple of credits, they're a long way from being a, like a licensed teacher. But if we could get you some micro-credentials, could we have you working as a paraprofessional in the school or like with the literacy training, that is essentially a micro-credentialing a micro course, but it's been structured and it has a hook into the di district so you have a place of employment once you finish that. You don't want to make the price point on that too high and then not have a way to you know get your money back. Um, we have done... I mean, there's certainly, I think there's much more opportunity here. I think it probably has more legs than the, like the online core, the MOOCs, the online courses, because I think it needs that structure and it either has to have a low cost. If, if it's no cost, there needs to be kind of like a structure to get you through. But I think the low cost credentialing programs actually have some value, but they're, they're in their infancy. Hi. Hi, Aaron. Hi. Um, from, I'd be interested in your perspective. You know, you've well documented all of the improvements and needs and what needs to be done with education. And I just wonder in the, your thoughts on the political acrimony that we have in this country, how in the world do we ever accomplish any of this? You now have um, the state of Texas governor taking over the Houston public schools. I think that's going to continue to be a movement around the country where Republican legislatures and governors 
uh, start trying to take over major city schools, which is going to create tremendous acrimony and political infighting, and it's hard to imagine how we can possibly come together to uh, solve so many of these issues. Well, one barrier on that is that a lot of large urban districts aren't particularly attractive to be run by the people that are running state government. So, um, the, meaning it's a tough job. And the Texas case, I think, is just a little bit unusual because um, you know that was—I mean—that was, I mean, was ex there was an expected on ramp for that. Um, but to the larger question of politics, I mean, I feel like that's a question for this organization. Somehow, Rotary manages to support humans and you know, the, the truth and fairness. And we've got Democrats and Republicans in this room. So I don't know how we get back to this space. I do know that people are so dug in. And also, teachers have other options. They're smart. They're problem solvers. They can multitask. There are other, I mean, many of them, just like journalists, feel called to do this. Um, you never make a lot of money. You get a little bit more flexibility in the summertime. But they have other, I mean, I, I do think that it's at some point you say, well, I'm going to leave. I, I didn't expect to see some of the educators in my circle of friends leave the profession, and, and they have, and that's a little surprising. Um, I think that one way that I see some movement in this is this larger uprising of parents. Now, there's, you can, I can be careful with that, too. There is a parent movement happening in this country. There's just this National Parent Bill of Rights in, in Washington that's kind of a political football, but there, there is something in the water right now that has kind of woken parents up to be more participatory. Can we harness that in some way that's productive and bipartisan? I don't know yet, but if anybody could figure it out with a rule book, it would be Rotary. <laughs> okay. Hi, Aaron. My name is Ryan Daniels. I'm the executive director of the Milwaukee Public Library Foundation. I want to thank Libraries. you. Libraries. You can get people together. You serve so, all types. Thank you, because that is actually a part of what I wanted to ask. First of all, I'll tell you that 98% of Americans, um, and I imagine that is of both political sides, yes. care about their public libraries. I will also share that there are more public libraries in the, in the United States than there are McDonald's. I heard you talk about after school and, and other things that can be done in some of your research. Have you seen um, school districts or others partnering with these other kinds of systems that can help us with some of the dire uh, situations that you laid out? Yeah, wow, what a lead-in. Uh, yeah, we've got a big effort going around. Uh, it's got a clunky title, but it gets to exactly what you're talking about. Um, Out-of-system innovation. So we're looking at where are like blocks of community learning, leverage points in the community, um, people with voice and power. It, churches, libraries, uh, grassroots parent groups that grow out of something in someone's basement. How are those, what, what is being learned there that could maybe be either adopted by districts or at least baked in handshake agreement? Like how do we get those running? Um, the places I've seen it, I haven't seen those exist any place yet in my own you know, uh, kind of loop around the horn in our work or former reporting where there wasn't some dynamo firecracker of a human at the center of it running the ships, right? And we know that in our city especially, like there are so many leaders in this city, but sometimes it feels like we live in a leadership vacuum. I mean, I, you hear the same names over and over again with certain things. I want to talk about how we generate that next kind of level of leaders where you can make something happen. And, and it's like, a, you know, uh, it's kind of like organizing, but it's also just trying to tap into something that's happening that that really does have value in the system itself um so i've also seen uh the a lot of these parent groups do have kind of a tie-in with some of these like community organizations um one here that I, I like a lot and i i do go and talk to them quite a bit is common ground i think probably you some of you are either familiar with them you know they they have a very uh you know they do tend to lean more toward the the union perspective but they really have a finger, the, a pulse on the community and adults on the ground. It's, so sometimes when decisions get made up here for people down here that aren't as connected, there's a, like we see this with school closures all the time. People think that they've engaged the community and it turns out you've got 200 people outside protesting. They probably didn't, didn't engage the community very well on that. So I think that there's energy there, but it takes leadership. And so that would be the thing that's like the secret sauce that we've got to work on. Thanks. 
My, my question is, is whether anyone, to your knowledge, has, has studied whether the poor outcomes and the absenteeism that you've talked about has any relation to the distance that, that kids often have to travel to school now, the number of different schools that, that kids, and particularly perhaps low-performing kids, the number of different schools that they go to during their 12 years, if they even have 12 years of, of education. I, I'm not an educator, but it's certainly, certainly my impression that while we may have gained a lot, we lost a lot when we lost the sense of a neighborhood school. Uh, and and I, I hope I'm wrong, because I, I don't see a neighborhood community-based school system that I think once existed. But has anyone studied that? And if, if that's a part of the problem, is there any way to address what we lost when we lost neighborhood schools and try to make up for that loss? Well, I mean, the cat's out of the bag a little bit here on that. I mean, and really elsewhere. I mean, we're not in a position anymore where we're forcing parents to go to their neighborhood school. There, I mean, there was a reason why we broke out of that, because not everybody's neighborhood school was high quality enough. Um, so we parents do expect choice. I don't think that the system can go back to limiting choice. Where you live depends on how much choice you have. Um, in some of the research I did around here with um, watching kids move from school to school to school, my working theory had been that because we have this kind of three three separate sectors of schooling here, that it was almost lessening the loyalty to one school and thereby increasing the likelihood that you might move somewhere else to, to kind of get fish whatever you're, for whatever you're looking for. And what I really found was that for a lot of poor families, it is, it is like today we're here and tomorrow we're there because that's what I need right now or I'm angry or I've got, I've, I've got, you know, I've got to get to the, uh, you know, healthcare for my kids. It, it was much more driven by um, lack of other life support and not having someone in your life that could say, no, no, it's really going to be better for your fifth grader if you stick with this one school all year and work out your interpersonal conflict with the teacher. And so we don't have, that is another thing that's happening around the country is like funding, um, like life, na like life navigators, like school navigators or education navigators to help parents make better choices so that they are at least evaluating what their choices are and picking the right one that they can stick with over time. 